Welcome to Pavinars, webinars for the pavement community. My name is Andrew Bram, and today we'll be talking about balanced mix design for asphalt mixtures. We're going to begin with a little bit of a background, Asphalt Mixtures 101, a very high overview, a little bit of a history of asphalt mixture design, and then superpave. We'll then go into what I call the pendulum effect, which is looking at cracking to rutting and then rutting to cracking and trying to manage these two primary distresses in the field. How do we not only manage, but balance this rutting and cracking, and what can we do to adjust the mix design in order to achieve this balance? We'll then go over a balanced mix design 101. We'll talk about the cracking and rutting tests that are available out there to quantify these distresses in the laboratory, and then what states are doing today. And then finally, we'll go over three case studies, one for Wisconsin, one for Virginia, and one for Arkansas Department of Transportation to give some real-world looks into what states are doing in order to implement balanced mix design. So when I think about types of asphalt mixtures, we have hot mix asphalt, or HMA, which is around 275 to 320 degree Fahrenheit production temperatures. We have warm mix asphalt, or WMA, which is 202 200 to 260 degrees Fahrenheit, and you can either have alternative productions including foam or various additives including chemical additives or synthetic additives. And if you want to know more about warm mix asphalt, you can look at the Pavenar Overview of Warm Mix Asphalt 2021 update, which was released in December of 2021. The third type of asphalt mixture, cold mixed asphalt or CMA, is known as cold central plant recycling when it's made in a plant and it can use either asphalt emulsion or asphalt foam. Now what is in these asphalt mixtures, HMA, WMA, and CMA? Well when you look at the asphalt mixture components you can look by both volume and weight. So aggregates by volume are about 84 to 93 percent by weight they're 93 to 97 percent. The asphalt binder or the asphalt emulsion residue for cold mix asphalt is 2 to 6 percent by volume or 4 to 7 percent by weight. And then the air is anywhere from 1 to 16 percent. You can see there's ranges on here and that has to do with the um, type of mix you're placing down, whether it's dense graded, gap graded, SMA, those type of things. But usually air voids are somewhere between 3 to 5 percent. And then one of my favorite exam questions is what is the weight of air? That would be 0%. And what are some of the potential additives? Well, in order to address cracking and rutting issues, you can put in polymers, elastomers, latex, rubbers, various fibers. For moisture damage, you can put in hydrated lime, amines, or amides. For production temperature, you can put chemicals in, waxes, different types of organics. And then for recycled materials, you can put in uh, reclaimed asphalt pavement or wrap, asphalt shingles or recycled asphalt shingles, RAS, plastics, various other things. But how do we take these aggregates, asphalt binder, and whatever additives you may or may not be using, and how do we mix this all together? Well, the first step of your mix design process is to consider the traffic, the environment, and what sort of local materials you have. You then select your materials and you mix them together. So with aggregate, you can look at different gradations and different types of aggregate. Aggregates are obviously very heavy, so you generally go with more local sources of aggregate. For asphalt binder, you can, actually, you can look at uh, different contents and different binder grades if you're using SuperPave. And the additives is really wide open. The list I gave on the previous slide is, is only a portion of the additives available. So there's all sorts of additives that can do pretty much everything but make coffee. You then need to compact your samples, and there's various ways of doing that, and you need to test your samples. For example, on the right-hand side, you can see a dynamic modulus sample being tested. And then you need to determine the optimal blend of materials. Now, if you want an introduction to hot mix asphalt mix design, there's also a Pavenar for that, and that was released in September 2021. But when you look at any type of mix design, really, Four and five is where all of the action happens. Really one, two, three, and six 
are the same regardless of what mixed design procedure you use, but where the variations come in is the compacted samples, how you compact the samples, and how you test the samples. So if you look at the United States, I recognize this is a United States centric uh, presentation, but that's because I'm in the United States. So if you look at the United States, Veeam in the 1920s out of California, they used a kneading compactor as the compaction mechanism. And then for tests, they used the stabilometer, the swell test, density, and air voids. The asphalt binder uses either the penetration grade or the viscosity grade, which can be either AC or AR, depending on if you age it. And you have a minimum stabilometer value, it's based on your traffic level, a maximum swell value just for heavy traffic, and you're targeting greater than 4% air voids. The Marshall Mix Design Procedure, uh, what well, came out of both the state of Mississippi and the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1930s, and you compact samples using an impact hammer. The tests that you run include stability, the Marshall flow, air voids, voids and mineral aggregate, VMA, and voids filled with asphalt, VFA. The asphalt binder, you use the viscosity grade. You do not use the aged version, just the AC viscosity. And you're looking for a minimum stability value and range of flow, again at three traffic levels, and a minimum VMA at three, four, and five percent air voids. Now the latest and greatest here in the United States is the SuperPave mix design system. And you compact samples using a SuperPave gyratory compactor. You test them using the tensile strength ratio, and you can see a picture of the tensile strength ratio on the right. The asphalt binder is based on climate and traffic, and we use the PG binder grading system. That PG stands for performance grade. And the requirements is that you set gyrations based on air voids, and the key is putting your end design at 4%. There's also an N initial and N max. And you're looking for a minimum TSR, a minimum VMA. There is a range of VFA you're shooting for, and there's a dust to binder ratio range as well. Now there are dozens of performance tests available and most of these tests revolve around rutting and cracking. So let's kind of think about this rutting and cracking a little bit. We've got a very brief overview of mixed designs and what's in asphalt mixtures, but let's look at this pendulum effect. So when we're thinking about how our roads in the United States went from cracking to rutting issues, we go back to the 1950s in Idaho and the Washoe road test and all of the mixtures were placed in less than four inch lifts on this road test. Moving on to the 1950s and the 1960s in Illinois, the ASHO road test, note how there's no T in that in the 1950s and 1960s, that's not a typo. And all of the tests there used less than six inch asphalt mixture lifts or thicknesses. And what happened is these two tests really caused what we can consider the classical fatigue cracking studies. And the two biggest ones came out of UC Berkeley and Nottingham over in England. And both of them revolved around the miners hypothesis of damage accumulation. And I do want to point out that I was lucky enough to visit the ASHO test road site. It was quite the event in Ottawa, Illinois, and I'm very proud to have been there. But then after the, um, fatigue cracking work had been done at Nottingham and Berkeley, we kind of started going from rutting to cracking. So in the mid 1980s, it was determined that mixtures became very susceptible to rutting. And this was a function of air voids, asphalt content, and the lab compaction methods. And so this led to the development of the Strategic Highway Research Program or SHARP. And this occurred in the 1990s and it was a nationwide study here in the United States and really a main focus of this work was rutting resistance. And they did a lot of work on angular aggregate, binder grades, and high levels of compaction. So what happened? This led to dry and highly compacted mixing. And the cracking returned. But you can ask the question, is all cracking the same? Was the cracking that was occurring in the 50s and 60s, is that the same as the cracking that's occurring today? That's one question. A second question is how do we balance rutting and cracking? And this is where this pendulum comes in is your mixes can either rut or they can crack or you can have some sort of happy median. Now I highly encourage you to download fatigue or not fatigue. That is the question. This is a white paper that Dr. Shane Underwood and I wrote and it's posted free on ResearchGate. 
So just go ahead and Google that term. You can download it for free. I'm very biased, but I think it is a very, very interesting read and it really digs into the past two slides. We went into a lot of detail, very interesting to think about what we term as cracking and how that definition has changed over time. Now you can think about running versus cracking also in a graphical format. So here you can see we have the binder content on the x-axis. It goes from 3 to 8%. That's not going to change. On the y-axis on the left-hand side, we have what I call running potential. And for example, this is just used in the APA, Asphalt Pavement Analyzer, rut depth, which is in millimeters. And you can see here, as you increase the binder content, you decrease the running potential. Then here on the right hand side, the cracking resistance, which is represented here by ideal CT, the CT index, as you increase the binder content, you increase the cracking resistance. So you have some sort of maximum rutting potential you want. Here I'm just saying it's a five millimeter rut depth is the maximum. So you have some sort of maximum rutting potential. And then you have some sort of minimum rutting potential and this happens to be 50 for the ideal CT, and that's your cracking resistance. And what you can do is you can drop these lines down. And the cracking test sets the lower binder content limit, and the rutting test sets the upper binder content limit. And what you do here is you establish a binder content range. And if you want to balance this rutting versus cracking, there's some sort of range of acceptable binder contents. So if you go below this range, you're going to be susceptible to cracking, in theory. If you go above this range, you're going to be susceptible to rutting, in theory. So this is where this range comes in, and this is where this concept of a pendulum came in. We swung too far with the binder content one direction, we got cracking. We swung too far with the binder content in the other direction, we got rutting. Now we're kind of swinging back. Have we gone too low again? So this is where this idea of a pendulum comes in. So what can you do? Can you adjust the mix design? Well, there are potential changes we can make to the super paved mix design. We can lower the design gyration so that end design level. We can increase the minimum VMA. We can lower the design air voids or add asphalt binder. We can perform an air voids regression. We can increase the asphalt binder film thickness or we can decrease aggregate size. Now these are many levers and they are not independent. You can't just increase VMA and expect everything else to stay the same. And I've had a lot of conversations with this with various people, and I really think that there's a key tripod here. You have to think about your volumetrics, which includes VMA, air voids, VFA. You need to think about your compactive effort, which is your number of gyrations. And then you need to think about your asphalt binder content, or specifically your effective asphalt binder content. So what's coding your aggregates? And if you change one of these and you don't change the other two, there could be issues with the other two. And it doesn't matter which one you look at, you can't just change one at a time because then you're just changing the length of one tripod leg, which makes you unsteady regardless of then how you hack away at the other legs. So you need to think of all three of these in concert. And this really was driven home in 2019 when uh, Nam Tran and his colleagues over at NCAT did a, a survey and asked which state agencies and included a couple of Canadian provinces were concerned with mixed design. And you can see here the blue states are concerned with mixed design and the vast majority of states in this figure are blue. So this is a very big concern with agencies around the United States and up in Canada. So some preliminary findings from um, trans study were they performed four experiments. They did an air voids regression and they found that higher asphalt binder contents were helpful. They lowered the end designs and they found that higher asphalt binder contents occurred without revising the mixed design. That's a key caveat. They found you could increase VMA and that would result in higher asphalt binder contents. And they also emphasized the need for accurate aggregate specific gravities uh, because that will give you a more accurate asphalt binder content. And that goes back to the effective asphalt binder. And some keys that they found was they wanted to reduce cracking without increasing rutting. And they wanted to make sure that they had proper amounts of binder activation from both RAP and RAS. And 
I am not doing this project justice with these past two slides, so again, I'm gonna recommend some other light reading for you, but if you Google NCHRP 20-07 backslash task 412, you can find Nam's uh, report, Dr. Tron's report from 2019, and it is a phenomenal report. As with everything NCAT does, it's, it's top level and very good and free to download. So we've talked a little bit about this concept of a pendulum. So how does this pendulum then interact with balanced mix design? Well, what is balanced mix design, BMD? Let's, let's start with that. And in order to do that, I wanna talk a little bit more about SHARP or SuperPave, the Strategic Highway Research Program. Now remember their compaction mechanism is a gyratory compactor. And they have, in the SHARP program, they recommend various mixture performance tests. And that includes moisture sensitivity, which is the indirect tensile test or the ITS. They included rutting, which is the shear test device, which is the piece of equipment you see on the right there. You love that computer off to the left-hand side, but if you've been lucky enough to see a shear test device, consider yourself fortunate because there are not many of them around. They're very expensive. And then they measured cracking with the indirect tensile test, the IDT. They also developed a slew of binder performance tests through the dynamic shear rheometer, the bending beam rheometer, and the direct tension tester. We don't see much of the direct tension tester these days, but there's been a lot of great work with the DSR and the BBR in recent years. And the problem is, is that the pendulum was sharp, it led to cracking, but rutting was still on people's mind. So we implemented sharp in the United States we now have a cracking problem, but people are afraid just to throw a ton of asphalt in it or to you know, change that end design level kind of arbitrarily because people are a little nervous about that pendulum swinging back the other direction and then we have a rutting problem. So it comes down to how do we balance rutting versus cracking? And this is where the term balanced mixed design comes from. Now, you can also take a step back a little larger because just saying it's rutting versus cracking is not 100% accurate. Some people are starting to look at this more through the lens of performance, through the lens of rutting versus durability. And durability can handle a whole bunch of different concepts, including cracking, but also moisture damage and even abrasion loss. So we're gonna dig a little more deeply into this concept of performance and this concept of durability. Well, let's first start talking about rutting and what are the rutting options? Well, potential rutting tests include the asphalt pavement analyzer, the APA. Now, we could have a robust discussion on whether or not the Hamburg wheel tracking test, the HWTT is a rutting test or a, uh, a moisture damage test. That's definitely an in-person conversation. I've seen it written both ways. I'm not 100% sure, but people are using it as a potential rutting test. You can do the flow number, FN, the beam stability test, and there are other potential tests, including the super paved shear test and ideal CT. Uh, but you can see all of these also have their associated either AASHTO standard or ASTM standard if you're interested in, in looking at the actual test methods for all of these. Now, moving from rutting to the cracking options, so going into this concept of durability. Well, not all cracking is the same. After you read uh, fatigue or not fatigue, that is the question, the white paper, you will agree, hopefully, with Dr. Underwood and I that not all cracking is the same. But we definitely have low temperature reflective cracking, which is BBR mixture testing and dish-shaped compact tension, or DCT. And I was fortunate enough to work with the DCT for my dissertation and the picture on the right there is actually a picture of one of my samples in the DCT up at the University of Illinois. So a lot of work went into making that sample, but I was really happy with the, the results and had a great team around me to execute the project. You can also look at the indirect tensile creep compliance and indirect tensile strength, the semicircular bend at low temperatures. That's very important. You can look at fatigue. This includes the direct tension cyclic fatigue and the flexural bending beam fatigue. You can also look at intermediate temperature cracking, the Illinois Flexibility Index, the ideal CT, and then the semicircular bend at intermediate temperatures. And then finally, there's various other tests that can potentially capture cracking, the uniaxial thermal stress and strain, the overlay test, and then the indirect tensile energy ratio and fracture energy. And you can see all of the associated standards with that as well. 
A lot of, lot of numbers, a lot of letters, but a lot of good information there. Now, remember I uh, had introduced balanced mixed design as sort of rutting versus cracking, but some people are starting to look at it as rutting versus durability. And when we think about durability, that includes cracking, moisture, and or abrasion. So if we look at potential moisture tests, we can look at the Homburg wheel testing, wheel test, which I personally think it's a moisture test. The indirect tensile strength, ITS, that could see the TSR, the tensile strength ratio. And then the moisture induced stress tester or mist. These are all potential moisture damage tests. And then you'll also find that some people are looking at abrasion loss through the Canterbury test. So you can see all the standards listed there. Now I encourage you to take a look at AASHTO MP46. This lists some of the tests that I've talked about. I've actually added a couple more, as you'll see why later on in this presentation. But AASHTO MP46 lists all of the rutting, cracking, and moisture tests that they think are salient. But then it also includes a very nice summary of what state highway agencies are doing and the limits that they have set for their rutting, cracking, and moisture damage tests. So it's a very interesting document. So I encourage you to try and get your hands on that and take a look at it. There's a lot of reading coming out of this Pavenar, but there's a lot of good information available too, and I just want you to be aware of it. Another phenomenal document, free of charge online, is the Napa Balanced Mixed Design Resource Guide, which is IS143, and this is executed by NCAT in 2021. So I think if you Google Napa IS-143, Balanced Mixed Design Resource Guide, some sort of combination of all these terms, and you'll be able to find it. It's free of charge on NCAT's website to download. And they looked at four different approaches, and they included case study summaries for balanced mixed design. So approach A is a volumetric design and performance verification. And you can see Illinois, Louisiana, New Jersey, Texas, Virginia, and Vermont use approach A. Approach B was designed as volumetric design and performance optimization, and according to their work, no states were currently using that. Approach C was performance modified volumetric design, which California, Missouri, and Oklahoma were using. And then approach D is performance design, which Alabama, Tennessee, and also Virginia again are using. Now, in addition to going through these four approaches and having case studies, it's very nicely done. Again, it's NCAT, everything they do is very well done. But in addition to the four approaches with the case studies, they also had multiple sections with guidance. So just various things of guidance that they recommended, which included selecting mixture performance tests, establishing test criteria, and modifying your existing mix design. So a wealth of good information in this document. And again, you can download it free of charge from NCAT's website. All right, so moving from balanced mix design, that overview to some case studies. We'll start with the absolutely beautiful state of Wisconsin, which is in the northern part of the United States. And I'm gonna just summarize some key findings from their report. Their key recommendations were to remove N initial and N max gyration requirements and only have N design. And they wanted to adjust air void requirements from two to 4%, excuse me, adjust the air void requirements so the new requirements are from 2 to 4 percent and this changes it from the previous requirements which were just 4 percent they had set end design at 4 percent their recommended adjustments was anywhere from 2 to 4 percent they also recommended to increase vfa and they provided balanced mix design for medium and high traffic mixes and for stone matrix asphalt or sma the balanced mix design performance test that they recommended was the Hamburg wheel tracking test for rutting and stripping, the ideal CT for intermediate temperature cracking. And I had mentioned that Wisconsin is in a northern climate, so they also included the DCT, the dish shaped compact tension for low temperature cracking, and then the TSR for moisture damage. And if you search WHRP, Wisconsin Highway Research Program, 0092-20-01, uh, you will be able to find this report. And again, it's an excellent report, and I recommend that you take a look at it if you are interested. Now, looking at the Virginia DOT, which is in the eastern part of the United States, they had some key recommendations. They used the two types that were defined in the NCAT report, performance plus volumetric and performance only. So they kind of used a hybrid type approach. 
They did not recommend changing any current air voids, VFA or VMA, but they did have liberal ranges on these that were a little bit unusual for traditional super paved mix design. So I think that they're kind of using some in place specs that some people would consider improvements on traditional specs, but they had already made those improvements. They developed uh, guidance for both standard mixtures, which essentially had low percentage of wrap and mixtures that had high percentages of wrap and they defined high wrap as greater than 40%. And then the balance mixed design performance tests that they recommended were the APA for writing the asphalt pavement analyzer, which is less than eight millimeters. Uh, now I apologize, they recommend the IDT-CT, and as far as I could tell, that's the same thing as the ideal CT. I apologize to Virginia if you have some subtle differences, but they claim that CT index should be greater or equal to 70 for cracking using the ideal CT as I read it. And then I had mentioned also, I added some tests on the um, uh, balanced mix design tests that I then summarized with Ashto MP46. Um, but the Canabro is not in that Ashto standard, but I included it because it is in Virginia's balanced mix design performance test. And they use an LA abrasion machine, and basically they're looking at a mass loss of less than set, less than or equal to seven and a half percent. So this is how they quantify durability of the mixtures. And if you search FHWA backslash VTRC 21-R15, you will be able to download their balanced mix design report free of charge as well. Then finally, finishing up with my home state of Arkansas, current home state of Arkansas. We are a southern state and we are currently looking at establishing a balanced mix design. And I'm quite excited because I feel that we're looking at a relatively innovative approach. The research is in progress as of May 2023 when I'm recording this. But basically we're using what we define as a hybrid CD approach. And what we're going to do is we're going to conduct writing and cracking tests at four levels of asphalt binder content and we are going to float the number of design gyrations. And based on this, we're gonna select the optimal binder content. We're gonna run the moisture damage tests. We're gonna measure required volumetric properties, and then we're going to establish a job mix formula for production. So we're not establishing any number of gyrations. We're gonna run writing and cracking tests at various levels of gyration, various asphalt binder contents, and we're gonna let the results of the writing and cracking tests determine our optimal binder content. Then we're going to run additional performance tests, measure the required volumetric properties, and report the volumetric properties for the job mix formula. So the mix design itself will be completely based on writing and cracking tests, but then we're going to report the volumetrics in anticipation for being able to use those for quality assurance in the field. So our experimental matrix is we're going to look at three different aggregate gradations. These are all 12 and a half millimeter nominal maximum aggregate sizes. There's going to be two fine aggregate gradations for surface courses, 0 and 15% wrap and one coarse gradation. We're going to look at 40 to 85 gyrations. So this is kind of spanning what we currently have now. We're going to go above that and then we're going to go a little lower than anyone that we have found in literature or the majority of literature. So we're going to really explore those different gyration levels. And then based on the gradation, you can get an estimated optimal binder content. And we're going to go at negative 0.5, the estimated level, plus 0.5, and plus 1% of asphalt binder. Now, this experimental matrix can also be represented by a cube, which you can see here on the right, which I'm actually quite proud of. That's a pretty cool figure, if you ask me. Um, but for testing, what we're going to do is for writing tests, we're going to look at the APA, which is RDOT's current writing test, and the flow number. For cracking tests, we currently don't have a cracking test in specifications. We've done some preliminary work with Ideal CT, but we're going to run both Ideal CT and IFIT because I personally believe that IFIT is one of the more popular cracking tests being used, especially at the intermediate testing temperatures. And we're also going to look at some other tests. One thing we're going to do is look at compaction metrics. And in my humble opinion, I think that we are grossly missing an opportunity by not collecting compaction metrics on every single sample we compact in the lab. Uh, compaction metrics are just based on number of gyrations and height. And I, sh I should probably do a pavement on compaction metrics, but a lot of my students' work 
the Pavenars I've made off of their published research publications have looked at uh, compaction metrics. So I encourage you to take a look at some of those. Because we've got to compact every sample, why don't we try and understand how that sample is compacting? There are metrics out there. So I say let's go for it. So we're going to be collecting the compaction metrics. We're going to be testing TSR. I love dynamic modulus. I think that is a solid test. I'm also trying to dip my toes into SVECD. Dr. Underwood would be very proud of me, but I think that um, I'd like to get that test up and going in our lab. And I want to compare these kind of higher level performance tests to the ideal CT, to the IFIT. And we're also going to work, uh, test the Humber wheel testing track. So I encourage you to stay tuned. This project is supposed to end in December 2024. So hopefully I'll be releasing a Pavenar that has all of our findings that We'll probably not answer all the world's questions, but I hope it'll be helpful for the community, and I certainly hope it will be helpful for the state of Arkansas. So we covered a little bit of background of asphalt mixtures. We talked about this pendulum swinging between cracking and rutting and back to cracking again. Gave a brief overview of balanced mix design and some resources available with that. And then I went through three case studies just to kind of show, hey, this is what some states have done, but it's obvious that States are concerned about their mixed design procedure, and I think balanced mixed design is certainly a way that we could potentially move forward. So I appreciate you joining me today. Thank you very much and hope you have a wonderful day.